when you're when you're choosing profit or people you choose the people and the profit comes it's a byproduct that's what people don't understand rockefeller back in the day if you saw the men who made america he used to be the kerosene guy and the byproduct of kerosene was gas well this guy thomas edison came out and he lit up america he lit up the united states so rockefeller's sitting there going what do i do with this byproduct and yet th then he was the richest man ever because of fuel and i think the byproduct of doing things great and taking care of people the byproduct is profit it comes naturally when you take care of people Welcome to the Waste No Day podcast, a podcast specifically for and about the home services industry as it relates to plumbing, heating, air conditioning, and electrical. More than a podcast, Waste No Day is a credo, a determination, a mindset. It is a never-ending discipline. It is a refuse-to-lose pursuit. It is a wake-up call every morning to waste no day. Now here's your hosts, Brian Burton and Nate Minnick. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Waste No Day podcast. Your hosts, Nate and Brian, are hanging out with you again, and we are looking forward to bringing back none other than the Tommy Mello back onto our show, The Return of the Mellow, as it is part one and part two. Yep, this is already going to be a part, a two-parter, and we are really excited to break into this conversation. Before we do all that, we're going to break down the ideas for you ourselves, and we're going to start with Brian and the quote. It's a small price to pay. But investing a little extra effort into the life you choose will move you from average, where the competition is, to the top. Richie Norton. All right. All right. That's, that's got to go down in the, uh, the Waste No Day books as uh, yeah. one like, of our quotes, you know. Circle back to that one. Yeah. Yeah. You should uh, do, do a little social media post like you used to. I should. Oh, well, he didn't, he didn't actually say it on the episode. True. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah, small price to pay. Uh, it doesn't feel like a small price to pay. You know when it doesn't feel like a small price to pay? It feels like a big price to pay when when you're faced with actually paying that price. <clears throat> and not not like now for me, listening to an audio book instead of music. Like You, you can barely get me to listen to music uh, during the workday. But when you first start doing it, when you first start investing in yourself and investing in yourself in the beginning probably isn't monetary, right? It's like time. What, am I going to listen to a podcast or the news music or an audio book? And in the beginning, when you first start doing it, you have to make that choice every time. Like, I don't know. I'm not really feeling some dude talking in my ear, you know? But as you do it more and more and more, and then you see yourself becoming more successful directly as a result of that audiobook or Waste No Day podcast or whatever it is, versus knowing that if you had listened to Lil Chirp or whatever some rappers' names are these days, where you... Lil Chirp? You know, Was that the title that you went with? Lil yeah. Chirp? <laughs> Sounds like a rapper these days, doesn't How it? How did you know that was my rap, my rap name? Oh, if this whole podcasting thing didn't work out, yeah. you're going to go. It's going to go with Lil Chirp. Oh, dang. Lidditz, Pennsylvania, I don't think has any famous white rappers. <laughs> well, so not, not yet. <laughs> it's coming. I, I still have hope for the podcast. <laughs> Maybe you can do both. <laughs> I mean, hey, if, if it all works out, I'll come back as a guest host every once in a while. Promise. I want that in writing. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> and today, guest hosting. DJ Lil Chirp. Lil Chirp. And then you just, we, we play like a little cut of your rhyme. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I can spit with the best of them. So in the beginning, early on, and you're, you're making that decision, it, it kind of, it's not fun. But as you go forward more and more, it's not a decision anymore. It's like first going to the gym. It's like first getting up to go to the gym. I'm up at four. I'm at the gym. I, I leave the house at 4.30 to get there by five. Yeah. More and more, it's like leave at 440 to get there at 510, 515. Sometimes stop and get, get anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the beginning, every time you have to get up, it's, it's a struggle. Well, I mean, in the beginning, most people just don't do it the first time, and it's something you never have to worry about. <laughs> Check. But if, yeah, that's, that's my man Minnick over here. 
But if you start going, it gets easier. It never gets easy. Like there's never a time when you get up at four o'clock. It's just an ungodly hour. I don't think anyone's supposed to be up at four, but it's the only time I can get up. It's the only time I can go to the gym where I'm not, I'm not, where I don't feel like I'm letting someone else down. Right. So if I go during, like take a lunch break and go probably missing lunch with the, the leadership team. If I go at the end of the day, then I should be with my family. Um, so wife, kids, somebody's let down there. <clears throat> if I go late at night, I'm uh, missing the only time I have with just my wife throughout the day. So that's not good. You're letting your mattress down at 4 a.m. Yeah, I am. I'm Feels letting, lonely. Letting it up, buddy. I go 220, you know. Got it. So, yeah. So, and if I don't go at all, I'm letting me down. You know what I mean? It's deep stuff over here, my man. Pontificating. Keep going. Yeah. So, at any time except that time, somebody's being let down. If I don't go at all, I feel like crap. Not just physically, but like emotionally, I just feel like I know there's something I'm supposed to be doing that I'm not doing. And it's not a great place to put yourself in, especially when you get to the point where you don't even care anymore. You don't hear that voice anymore. That's the worst place you could possibly be. So get up at four, make that move, you know, in here when I have to be in here. But after like two months of it, you know, I started doing it with, with people, like accountability. Now I have people who come in and out. I got my man Paul from our, our uh, drain team supervisor. Meet me there in the morning. Sometimes Tyler, our uh, HVAC service manager, meets me there. But people are in and out of whether they're going or not <clears throat> periodically, but it doesn't matter to me. I'm be, I'll am i be there anyway. I take the occasional day off. If I'm, like, really beat up, I won't go. Um, it's not like a religion or anything, but six days a week, typically, I'm lifting weights. And it's now such habit that I, I would not know what to do otherwise. And the training thing works that same way. Like what, I, what you get into your truck or into your car on the way to work or on the way to your call and flip on should be a habit. Like, you know, Monday morning, I'm listening to the Waste No Day podcast, as you should be. Tuesday morning, listening to an old episode, as you should be. <laughs> Don't care what you do Saturday morning, all right? You do whatever you want, but the other six days. <laughs> but that's the, there's there's a price to pay in the beginning. And like my man, Richie Norton said, it's a small price to pay. But investing a little extra effort into the life you choose will move you from average where all the competition is to the top. And you do have to choose that life. I want the life of a guy who can move some weight around, you know, it's, it's all relative. But for me, what I move is a lot of weight, um, pretty fit, gets up very early, goes to sleep at a decent time. I don't drink, I don't hang, I don't do any of that stuff. Successful and, you know, again, it's all relative. But for me, I'm very, very successful in most aspects. And this is the life I choose. So I have to make some sacrifices to get there. Small prices to pay for what I want. It's well said, Brian. And the one thing that <clears throat> struck me right there as you were talking is what happens when that voice goes away. So as kids, you know, I think we're, we're trained, you know, if you had some semblance of parents or teachers or somebody speaking into your life to help guide you along at least what was good and what you should be focusing on. You know, and they're saying like, hey, you know, study in school and read your books or eat healthy. Don't stay up late, those types of things. And you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you don't take much, uh, much merit in that stuff when you're younger, of course. And then you get older and it starts to matter a little bit more. And you start understanding some of the wisdom behind it, but it doesn't get easier for sure. In fact, it probably gets even harder because you know, now there's 35 other things pulling at your attention instead of focusing on those things that you know are good for you. And so you start quieting that voice down or ignoring it time and time again. And every time you do, the voice does get a little bit quieter and a little bit quieter. And to your point, Brian, 
if you're at a place where there is no longer a voice inside of you challenging you saying you can do better than that or was that really the best that you had in you if you're not hearing that voice anymore you need to take pause about your life a little bit and ask what's going on because if there's nothing inside of you that's pushing you to do, to go forward if there's nothing inside of you that's challenging you to make more of yourself of your life of your circumstances than you currently are we need to we need to hit the reset button and find that voice again there has to be an internal grind there has to be an internal motivation that pursues us and pushes us to become better and some of that might mean that you need to be that external voice for somebody else. We can never have too much motivation in our lives or, or friends or people around us that challenge us or, or just encourage us along the way. And for some of you listening, you are that voice for somebody else. So if you know somebody who could, you could lend a hand to, who you could just speak some words of life into, um, hit the pause button on this podcast, give them a shout, text them, call them, and let them know that, you're behind them and you want to see them succeed. For, for some of you who are on the other end of that line and, and you're feeling like, man, I just don't know where else to go. We want this podcast to serve as that reset button for you. We want you to stop right now and ask yourself, what am I trying to do here? Where am I trying to go? What am I really about? What does it mean to be insert your name here and if you can answer that question honestly perhaps that gives you the motivation that you need to to start taking the steps that it's going to take to accomplish the goals you want to set in your life the point is don't be satisfied with who you are if you come to a, a place of complacency, you've come to the dead end. And it's time to turn around because that's not the end of the road. And so we hope that this podcast and specifically this guest with Tommy is going to inspire, stir up some things inside of you that are going to reinvite that voice back into your life. Turn up the volume a little bit on what's been, been muted for so long and say, hey, hey, this could be you. This could be something. You could do something with this. You could go somewhere with this. And Tommy's such a great and inspirational guest. I have no doubt that he's going to bring some excellent words of inspiration for a podcast today. Well, before we bring Tommy on, we want to bring Albert on. Who's Albert? Albert is uh, Apparently a big fan of the Waste No Day podcast. How do I know? Because Albert left us a shining, glowing five-star review. I love all the talk about sales. Me too, Albert. I also like hearing the stories and advice from successful salesmen in the trade. Definitely a great podcast for upping your game. Albert Balestrieri. Albert Balestrieri. I bet that sounds like. Dude, you killed that. If I, uh, if, if I butchered your name, that's my bad, Albert. And we appreciate the five-star review. And if you get anything out of this podcast, do us a solid back. We, we don't play commercials. We don't have anything to sell you. We don't plan on it um, in the near future, at least. Uh, but one thing we would like is if you can drop us a five-star review, tell us what the show has done for you, and certainly set up the automatic downloads and tell somebody about the show and tell them to set up automatic downloads. The reviews as, as I see it, or, or as far as I can tell are what makes people want to come on the show because they can just open the Apple podcast app and look the show up and see how many reviews it has. And that tells you a lot about it. Um, also, Spotify has has the same. I don't think you can leave like written reviews, but you can just click the five star button when you open the show now, and that's pretty new for Spotify. So, do us a solid, hook us up with a nice review, and if you put your name in it, I will most likely read it on an episode. And as far as Tommy's concerned, Tommy has a uh, 
an event coming up that we're going to talk about in depth, I'm sure, called Vertical Track. Uh, Nate and I will be at Vertical Track in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is October 12th. I want to say October 12th, 13, 14. Um, if you come, just come and say what's up to me and Nate. Nate will be wearing the Waste No Day t-shirt, hat, pants, and shoes, I believe, and probably some sunglasses with Waste No Day on them. That's probably what my look's going to be. Come say what's up. We're, we're uh, happy to have a chat. If, if you, you just shout out Lil Chirp, I'll turn my head. Yeah, if you that. yell Lil Chirp, Nate's going to come ru- rapping. I, was, I almost said running, but he's going to come rapping. Um, if you plan on going or like this episode and want to check it out, go to verticaltrack.com, and we have a promo code that he gave us for the podcast. It is VT, like vertical track, VT Waste No Day, and that will get you $250 off. Nice. Your tickets. Thanks, Tommy. Yeah. And we're not, uh, again, I said we don't advertise on here. He did offer to give us a little piece for each ticket sold. We did not accept because we do not advertise on the show. So we're going to talk to him about maybe maybe upgrading our tickets, you know. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so check it out. Come see us. I heard a lot of great feedback about his event in, what, I forget. I think he did one early this year. And a good friend of the show and a good friend of Nate and mine personally, Lenny Sears, who owns a uh, one-hour Ben Franklin and Mr. Sparky in Florida, said that it was it was massive for him and his team, very impactful. And he actually thanked us personally because he heard about Tommy through his first episode of Waste No Day and ended up going to this event before, and he said it was just huge for his team. So we're actually going this year – at mostly as a result of Lenny and him saying how good the event was. Oh, shout out to Lenny. Appreciate you, man. Well, without further ado, we are going to put Tommy Mello back in your passenger seat. Tommy Mello is the owner and operator of A1 Garage Door Service, the host of the Home Service Expert Podcast and owner, partner, or investor in 14 other businesses ranging from Christmas lights to real estate to mobile apps. In 2007, Tommy became the sole owner and operator of a single Phoenix-based garage door service business, which came with $50,000 in debt. Today, A1 generates north of $170 million, looking to be over $200 million, with employees and operations in many states across the nation. Tommy is a regular contributor to Inc., Entrepreneur, and other business publications on the topic of entrepreneurship and small business, as well as sought-after podcast, radio, and television guest. When not in the office or working on the business, you'll find him on a plane, headed to exotic destinations, or chasing the little white ball around one of Arizona's many golf courses. Welcome to the show, Tommy. Hey, appreciate being here. Great to have you back on, buddy. Uh, well, it's been a whole like half hour since we talked, but our do as per our last conversation on the podcast when it ended. Now I'll say that every conversation I have with you when they end, I just I I need a minute. Like I I gotta go somewhere, <laughs> like pr- preferably dark and quiet, and just process everything you just said. Um, and you know we're we tend to be kind to our guests for sure. But your podcast, Home Service Millionaire, um, the book, it's just, it, you're someone I, I personally get a ton of value from. And for us to bring you on the show to promote, you know, Vertical Track, your event, the book, your podcast, anything you're doing, it feels to me like the absolute least I can do. I appreciate that. Yeah, we have a lot of fun and uh, learn a lot, actually. The podcast that I do is, is like consulting for me. I get to talk about whatever's going on in the business and talk to experts and really helps drive me uh, to new, new boundaries and uh, set new goals. So it's been fun. I think that's one of the biggest things is dreaming bigger. I was talking to my managers yesterday about just their goal setting is not quite like mine. (laughs) <laughs> I imagine yours can be a little overwhelming to people. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I figure you shoot for the stars. If you land on the moon, you're still doing good. You know, 
Absolutely. And so for some of our listeners, they may not be familiar with you, which uh, is no better time than right now to learn. So could you give us like the five minute cue up as to who Tommy Mello is? Yeah, you bet. Uh, I'm from Sterling Heights, Michigan. I moved to Phoenix, Arizona when I was 16 to finish up high school. Go blue. Just Coming from that. Detroit, you, you, the Midwest, you learn how to shovel snow and mow lawns. So I did that when I came to Phoenix. I was a bus boy. Um, spent a lot of time in the restaurant industry and uh, just kind of fell into garage doors. I had a roommate that was answering phones for a garage door company and I started painting garage doors. And that was awesome. I, I figured out a way to make a grand a day painting doors. And uh, then I just got into the garage door industry. And 2007, I found my way into that industry. And for the first seven years, I spent in the truck. So I've done it all. I've been the inventory guy, the tax, the payroll, you, you name it, I've done it. And I was a technician for a long time. So I've lived the life of a technician. So I say I've been in the business 15 years, but really eight years is when I started to work on the business. And 2017, I got on the service Titan. Um, I always been able to make a lot of revenue, never really was able to keep it till the last five years. And service Titan, now Levy, seven power contractor, Alan Rohr, I, I, you name the consultants, the groups, the, I've spent a lot of time with Ken Goodrich, Tom Howard, um, just spend a lot of time learning and always being a student for life. And that's, that's kind of the principles I live by is I try to be the dumbest guy in the room. When I, when I play sports, whether I go golfing or shooting pool or bowling or whatever it is, I try to be around really good people that, that elevates my game. And, you know, this, this year is a good year for us. We're buying companies, uh, mostly in the garage door industry. And, uh, you know, our goal was 150 million. We're, we're, we're not quite going to hit that goal, but with these purchases, I think we'll be approaching 200 million. So wow. it's, uh, the, the secret sauce is we build our own technicians. We recruit amazing people and we teach them how to do garage doors rather than waiting for a great technician to show up at our door. And I'm very aggressive. I recruit. I go find great people. I don't wait for them to come to me. Yeah, I love that. I've seen some of your strategies, and it is groundbreaking stuff. And it's awesome how you can just basically pull from the best personalities and the best communicators in the world that you come across and bring them into your system and train them up in the way that A1 wants. Yeah, the A1 way, it's a, it's a clear path to six-figure income the first year. We, we really support our guys. It's an eight-week program. And, you know, there, there's not a whole lot I don't try to do. We've got a 401k now. We've got the Dave Ramsey program, teach them how to save their money and get good credit scores. We've got a dream manager that we sit down and we really focus on their dreams and their goals and how they win the game um, instead you've, of just. You've had that dream manager for, what, a year now? Yeah, about a, probably a little over a year, yep. How's that? Do you, do you have um, some stories of, of guys and how that's uh, affected their lives? You know, it seems like on a daily basis, someone's having a kid or buying a house or getting their dream uh, boat or, or, or whatever it might be. Usually I tell the guys to try to invest as much as possible in appreciating assets. But just last week, a guy bought a house in Michigan, and it's just an honor when I see people winning around me. I, I absolutely love it. I've got a guy in Milwaukee that owns six rental houses. Um, I had a guy, his name's Justin. He's on my virtual product specialist team, and he needed... I, I sent it to my credit repair guy and he's like, dude, I, I just don't have the money to do this. I was like, well, how much do you need? He's like 1500. So this was a couple of months ago. His credit score was like a 560. Now it's a 740 and he already paid me back. But those little things make, make a huge impact in their lives. And uh, I just love seeing them win. I'm not one of those owners that is like, you guys aren't allowed to make more money. And I think there's a lot of owners that don't open the books and they don't, everybody knows I make a lot of money. I don't care. Yeah, we're at twenty three point eight percent EBITDA, and we're setting huge goals, record months, record weeks, record days. And I'm not shy to let people know. You're on track to do like what one seventy this year. You know, we've got some big companies we're, we're we're working on that if I close them, they should be close to two hundred. My budget was one fifty. I think A one alone will do about one forty. We're talking 140 million here for anyone not familiar with Tommy and A1 Garage Doors, but wow, it's a big deal. 
at 23. It, you know, it's, it's, it's very satisfying, but at the same time, I came up with a quote yesterday. Uh, never satisfied, always happy. I'm never content. I'm never like, man, we made it. Like, we celebrate. But ultimately, you know, I see this industry, I see us able to do 400 million of EBITDA in four to five years. And that's really, that's the number that I want to be at. Oh, well, that's one of the reasons we have you on here, Tommy, is because you're shooting, you're shooting high, man. And we like people like that because it pulls us along with you. That's fantastic. Yeah. None of this, the secret nonsense where you're put, putting a poster of a number on your headboard or something, you're shooting high and then going out and making it happen. Well, it's reverse engineering. What needs to happen to hit those numbers and direct goals. Not what needs to happen this year, not this quarter, but this month, this week, today, what, what actions do I need to make? And fast way to get there is to consolidate by some of these companies that don't want to go through a recession. It's the best timing. And what I find is there's very simple things that could turn on and move the needle. Um, they're not open nights and weekends. They never heard of a turnover. They don't support their staff. They don't train for performance pay. Um, they don't really recruit a whole lot. They don't get the pricing that I get. So you go in there, you pull a few levers, you turn on to my marketing machine and all of a sudden double the ticket average and fix the stuff right. Take care of it like you take care of your mom. All of a sudden, you know, if you're paying five times, you get it down to an effective multiple of under one. And they're millionaires. They're happy because we're not firing their, you know, we're, we're keeping their entire staff, but giving them new things to look forward to. And change is always scary. You know, Darwin, Charles Darwin said, something along the lines of it's, it's not the species that are the smartest nor the strongest. It's the one that can adapt to change the fastest. And that's one thing that we really talk a lot about is we're ever changing. We're, we're always working. We're bettering our best every day. That's fantastic. And so Tommy, one of the things that we wanted to talk to you about right now is just what's on your mind, man. You're always one who's innovating and thinking about what's coming up. What are some things that have been tossed around in the mind of Mello? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I've got a lot of people that have done amazing, amazing, amazing things. And one of the things they really focus on is when you're doing acquisitions is implementation. I know of a couple of companies that are run by PE now, which I'm not, um, but they, they haven't integrated properly. They're not running the same systems, the same software, the same KPIs. The training doesn't match. They're each kind of in their own silo. And that's, Really what you talk about is how do you buy a company, integrate fast, and continue to – marketing is a three-phase approach I, I talk a lot about. It's, it's getting the right clients. It's getting the great coworkers that I get to, to, to call A1 now. And then it's also finding amazing companies that have hit a ceiling, and they're, they're just – you know, they're, they're at an age now where they're just they're – not, they're not wanting to do it anymore. And – uh Really what it's all about is just putting the plan in place and continuing to sprint. I mean, we do a, we do a trip called the uh, Pinnacle Club where anybody that does over a million dollars gets to go on this trip. And I've never seen more people that are begging to go figuring out ways to hit a million dollars. It's so much fun. And uh, we went to Cabo, San Lucas last year, and we're going to have an amazing trip coming up. And uh, – it's so much fun because everybody wants to be on this trip. It's a lot of managers and it's just, we go fishing, we have a blast. And the, I want to just do a lot more of that stuff. I'm starting to kind of enjoy the moment a little bit more than I ever have. Also, I love work. I built the dream job because I do everything I love to do and I hire around, all around my weaknesses. So uh, on my mind is spoiling as many people as I can, creating lots and lots of millionaires and, uh, you know, it's, it's just so much fun. I, I got to tell you, I love my life. I really do. I'm not just a guy that goes out there and has an event because I don't care if I make money. I make my money for my business. And by sharing and, and sharing some of the knowledge and the wealth that I've been able to acquire through podcasting and books and just consulting, um, meeting great consultants, it's really about uh, building something together and not being snake oil. You know, there's a lot of guys out there that can't make it in the real world. They literally, their businesses, they don't make money, but yet they're coaching and they're, they're telling people what to do. And yet they don't make any profits. 
So I think it's, it's, it's pretty profound. I'd say one out of maybe five consultants slash gurus in the home industry actually know what they're doing, you know? Who, who are some of the ones that you have respect for? And then we'll get to the other list. <laughs> well, Al Levy taught me a lot of stuff. Um, I will say Al Levy's done amazing things with me. He's, he's kind of the, the opposite of me. He's super organized, super, the fundamentals, the standard operating procedures, the manuals, the, the checklist. So I needed him in my life. So he's done a lot for me. I got a guy, Jonathan Wisman. He wrote the sales boss. He's how me look at things a lot differently. Um, that being around Tom Howard is a wealth of knowledge. Uh, I've got a guy that works for me now that basically he tells me I captured him because I didn't really give him an option not to work for me. And he's just a guru. He's a developer. He was a CEO of a manufacturing company. He understands systems and he knows how to manipulate software in the right ways to build sequences and standard operating procedures. So that's just been a game changer. And then I'm learning about getting available funds, like working with the bank. And, and so now we do audited financials and we do a lot of things that I never thought was important, but it is important because now we have more access to money than I've ever thought possible. Speaking of access to money and things that are important, you did write a book uh, not too long ago called Home Service Millionaire. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? And also, I think you have another book that you're working on right now. Yeah, so I wrote a book because I've learned a lot of lessons. I mean, if there's a mistake to be made, I've made it. So I wrote this book and I put a lot of interesting ideas in there and I gave it to Al to read. And he said, this sucks. You, you need to do more. It needs to be better. So then I got 12 co-authors. I've got uh, Brian from SF, SF and S Partners uh, talks about how to build a company to sell. I've got Alan Rohr that talks about the financial quick check. Al Levy talks about manuals. I've got Ara Medesian, the CEO of Service Titan, who talks a little bit about picking the right software. Um, just basically put as many people as I could that I thought could influence a really good book. And I think it came out pretty well. I, I, I had a lot of fun doing it on Audible. And then the new book is crazy. I, I, I'm kind of crazy for putting this book out because I'm giving away everything. I'm giving away my ride-along forms, my checklists, my, the way we recruit, the way we train, um, the, the little things we do that make a huge impact. And it's called Elevate because I truly believe everybody needs to win. And so how do you elevate everybody's life? The owner took a lot of chances and a lot of owners think, I've taken all the sacrifices. You know, nobody should make more than 60 grand a year. The CSR should make $15 an hour. I believe everybody, CSRs, dispatchers are entitled to make six figures. So it's my job and my dream to dream big enough to fit their dreams inside of mine and make sure they're winning every day. And our, cl our clients need to win. Our vendors need to win. The partnerships that we're creating need to be winners. I see all these companies that are rolling up and you look at their businesses and there's always a win-lose situation. Like someone's getting shafted. And I just don't believe in that motto. I believe that we could pay great money. We don't have to hide things and change the deal last minute. Uh, you know, the, the hard part is a lot of the companies I'm going after, they do Home Depot, home warranty, construction, some new construction. They do a little bit of commercial. They, it, like, they do everything. And it's very hard when, they, when they're not doing a lot of revenue or profit and they do a little bit of everything. But the best advice I could say, if you ever want to sell a business, take one thing and be the best you could be at it. Don't, you know, there's guys, I do fireplaces, I do garage doors, I do windows, I do commercial, I do residential, I do Home Depot, I do Costco. I'm like, so anything you can make a buck at, you do. And I think that's a huge, huge mistake. I, I, you have certainly been a case study in that concept there, Tommy, where you have absolutely focused in on garage doors. And if you'd be kind enough to share maybe uh, one concept from the Elevate book that you think is really special for our listeners that we can anticipate what you'll be writing. Well, well, the, the simple notion is if you start thinking about how they're going to walk away thinking they got a fair shake, whether it's a company you're buying or an employee, how can you go about what, what, like, here's what really gets me excited is when somebody's able to take their dad who they haven't spent time with in the last decade on a two week fishing trip or to Alaska, or they get to actually bring a child into this world that they know they're going to be able to support in ways they never thought possible. Or 
You get a guy that was working at another company eight jobs a day, six days a week. That's now his uh, their kid's soccer coach, and they can make it to every school play, and they can be home for supper. So it really is this this thought of building trust, letting people know you make money, uh, opening up the doors. I think what happens is without having, uh, I'm big on owning your calendar and being able to delegate and being able to dream, dream bigger and build this life that you want uh, and be able to share. You know, I, I see a lot of companies that want to sell and they're like, just take care of my pe- people, take care of my people. 20% of my company is owned by employees. It's an equity incentive program. Now I still make all the decisions and the equity is not vested for everybody, but ultimately I think that that's helping us run in the same direction. They, they're sprinting faster than I ever thought possible. And you know, this is what private equity companies do. They, they break off usually 10 to 15% for employees. And it's amazing when you can get everybody working in the same direction, every aspect, listen, my dispatchers, my CSRs, my technicians, and my installers are all on performance pay. So I don't care if they come in two weeks later and they make more than the guy that's been here for 10 years because I don't believe in tenure at the company. I believe that someone could come in and work their tail off or just be smart and make as much money as they want. And I never, ever get upset if someone makes five grand in a week. I, I think I get excited that somebody makes that kind of money. So that's kind of the whole notion is how do you set up a system where everybody feels like they're winning, they're accomplishing their goals, their dreams, everything they've wanted in their life. And if you could figure that out and it's never easy, um, you you start enjoying each day. And that's really what the book is about. But there's a lot of things in there that uh, we give. I'm giving a lot of things away that I've done with my ride along forms and training and building technicians and how to recruit. You know, I played a lot of high school sports and recruiters came and they watched games. They didn't wait for them to come to you. Military recruiting is the same way. Nobody, I say 10% of the people actually say, I'm going to go into the military. They actively go out and they get it. And I think that's so important to go actively pursue great people and always coaching. You know, I don't like managers. I love coaches. My coach cared just as much out of the game as he cared in the game. He made sure I was fed every night. My mom worked three jobs. And they cared. And that's how you need to be as, as an owner, founder, manager. You need to start coaching because I've seen B players become A-plus players with the right love, attention, love and attention. Is that, is that a concept that you try to employ into your, your actual company there, Tommy? And what does that look like in practicality? Well, you know, what it looks like is uh, people are making lots of money. But more importantly... They're learning the things they never learned before, like delayed gratification and making sacrifices. And just, I'll tell you guys, I'm going to be buying a pretty decent sized house here. And I never thought I was going to do this, but I'm buying it because I want to have people over and enjoy all of our hard work. And I want them to buy a big house, but I'm just an entertainer. And what it looks like at A1 Garage or Service is people are lined up. We had 90 people come to a hiring event. And I talk in the book, I'm showing how you can do events. And, and we had the radio station there. We had two food trucks. 90 people showed up. We hired 30. We hired 21 techs, seven CSRs, and two dispatchers. Truly amazing. 30, 30% of the people who showed up got a job. Yeah, it, it was <laughs> it was a very, very, very good event. And, you know, <laughs> wow. Out of the 90 that showed up, about 80 showed up and 10 trickled in the whole week and they heard we're hiring. And uh, what the, some of the simple sauce that I, uh, I kind of figured out late in the game is our training center is like you walk through there, it's a recruiting machine. It's We've got a Harley Davidson, we've got a, a dirt bike. We, we made it look and feel like a real garage. We've got golf clubs and, and, and games and things that you'd have in your garage, tent equipment. And when you're training, we really focus – on eye contact, body language, tonality, the words to use, when, when to ask a question, how to bring up financing, which we never call financing, we call it promotions. And we say simple things like, hey, did you want to use our money or your money today? <laughs> and uh, it's, it's simple little tactics that all I do is I study winners in the company. So I've got a guy that's had 80% service agreements, conversion rate, 80% of his clients, eight out of 10 he's selling a membership to. So I'm, se- I'm sending my lead trainer to Albuquerque to watch this guy. 
and then I'm going to have them implement it throughout the whole company. And if I, if I don't hit 80, I won't be upset. If I hit 40% of our customers get memberships, because right now we're hovering right around 18 to 20%. So we're going to go study the best of the best, and then we're going to integrate that throughout the whole company. That's such a, a good way. And, and unfortunately, so many people are too proud to look down uh, where some ideas are coming that could be really innovative and revolutionary for their entire business. And it's so cool to hear you at, at approaching $200 million, you're still getting down on the ground level and saying, who's got the best idea and how can we implement it? You know, it's interesting. We do, I, I do a meeting where I interview a couple of people a week and it goes out to the whole company for Thursday mornings. And this last one was about 25 minutes. And I interviewed one of our, basically like a comfort advisor, but we call it a uh, product specialist. And he said, yeah, we do this all just through, through the phone. We turn it over. He's got three monitors at his house. We've got about 12 of these guys. We take the best of the best. We, now we get them on 15 to 20 calls a day rather than just doing three calls, four calls. So he said, the secret sauce guys is connecting with the customer. There's two things. That, there's actually three things that need to happen. And there, there's more, but these are number one, Mr. Jones, I want to tell you, I can work anywhere I want in the country, really anywhere in the world with garage doors. The reason I chose a one garage door service is they, they look after me. They look after my family. They make sacrifices to make sure we're taken care of. We're their internal clients. And I trust them with my life and my family. And you should trust them too. I choose to work here. We've got the core values we abide by. We've got our mission, our vision. I want to show you this stuff. Come out to my truck real quick. I love this company and I think you'll love them too. And that's why you should choose us. Number one. Number two, then they connect with the client. They play with the dog. Uh, we never ring the doorbell. We knock because friends knock. Strangers ring the doorbell. We, we offer coffee on the way. They get a beautiful profile from Service Titan that tells them all about the technician. We, we go above and beyond to connect with the client for over an hour. And Justin was like, dude, if they're there for an hour to an hour and a half and then doing the turnover, like that's almost a done deal because they bonded, they started the work, they've done everything right. And then the third thing is getting them pre-financed. And hey, listen, have you heard about our promotions? Did you want to use our money? Listen, there's no hard pull. It's real simple. Let's see what you qualify for. Even if you plan on paying with a credit card, you don't pay anything for the first six months after we install it. This is just right now. There's no better time. And if they go after like the two year, no interest, you're like, you say, well, why don't we just do 20 years? Your payment will be under 50 bucks. And if you want to, there's no prepayment penalty. So you pay it off early. So those three things, they love the company. They love the technician and the money's out of the way. It's a low, low, low payment. You get those three things. It's a slam dunk. Now, Tommy, you've talked extensively, whether on this podcast or previous ones or on your own, about the amazing work that you do in the recruiting and training center of taking people with no experience in the garage door industry and training them up in the A1 way so that they are experts and, and going out. But do you do any external training? What about sending your people other places to conferences or, or third-party events or whatever's going on? Do you do any of that? Yeah. So for example, I was on the phone earlier with a guy We're we're getting everybody disc certified. Um, that that's something we're paying for, you know, Pantheon with service Titan, they allow two people. I bought 20. Um, <laughs> my guys are traveling. My management team are traveling to HVAC shops every other week. The, uh, the Brent Buckley in Las Vegas, I sent out a couple trainers and a couple managers to spend a day with him. Um, Tom Howard's always coming into town. We, we, we invest a lot in third party trainers. Uh, you know, Joe Cassara has come out for a week. I think it's very, very important that they're not hearing the message only from me and that they get to explore because I learn everything I know from guys like Ken Goodrich, Ken Haynes, David Geiger, Terry Nicholson. I spent a lot of time traveling and I thought, how cool would it be to be able to share this blessing with everybody and allow them to go see the HVAC industry and learn from the best industries in the world? which HVAC is 30 years above garage doors. Frank Blau in 91 figured out a lot of things that we've just adopted. We didn't need to reinvent the will. So I feel like as much as I can, there's no limit to how much I'll invest. If somebody wants to do something, I'll bring in an expert and I'll get them trained on it. Sandler training. Uh, you, I invest in a lot of books we read together. There's a great book we're reading right now called The Coaching Effect. I've already read it three times, but now, now I've got all my virtual product specialists reading that book. It's just, you know, Getting Ken and Ken Goodrich comes in probably once every couple of weeks and we just toss ideas around. And that's the secret sauce is I don't keep things a secret. 
And I remember all my managers, everybody at A1 thought I was crazy. Why are you doing a podcast? Why are you talking about all the things we figured out? It took us years. And, and now they're like, oh my God, the best thing you've ever done is start the podcast and, and gives things away because number one, it's hard to implement these things. But number two is we're not the bad guys. We're the good guys. Everybody thought, A1, man, those guys, those young guys, they come into our market, they take over. Now they're like, they're inviting us into their house and they're sharing everything. I want the whole industry to win. You see, for me to win, other people don't need to lose. That's the biggest misconception. There's enough water in the ocean for everybody. It's it's an awesome concept, Tommy. And I, I love how you just embody that with how you're talking and, and clearly what you're doing in your company. And it's, in, it's so important to invest into our people. And that's one of the things that you've been talking about there. In, in terms of investing in the people, what are some other retainment strategies that you've employed to make sure that you go through the whole process of training somebody up. And I'm sure it takes weeks or if not months to get them in place, but how do you actually keep them there? How do you keep them wanting well, to stay at a one? Well, the two month program when you train and then we've got dedicated, we've got a whole dedicated team. We call, we've got traveling techs. It's called the map program market acceleration tech training. And so we've got that program. We've got another program that just work with markets. They go take two markets at a, a, a month and then they'll work with each guy and having them set personal goals, having them understand what their conversion rate, what their average ticket needs to be, how many memberships they need to sell, and getting them on track to understand how they could win the game. But I'll tell you, 82% of people don't leave a company that when they have best friends that work there. And that's a stat. I, I had a podcast with a gal named Barbara on Home Service Expert, and she was explaining to me, she's been doing this since the mid early 80s at recruiting. So how do you develop relationships in the company, well, you do it outside of work. You invite the families, you go bowling, you, you go play uh, volleyball. It doesn't cost anything to go play volleyball or have a picnic or watch a movie. Um, people are like, man, I just don't have the money for that. I always tell people, can you go to Costco and buy some this quick? Can you cook for your people? You start cooking every day for your people. Watch what happens. See, recruiting is amazing, but when you got the back door open and everybody's walking out and quitting, you're just, you're like, I don't want to train anybody because they're all leaving me because you got this mentality that they don't get to win. And here's the secret sauce is I'm priced right. I'm not the, not the most expensive, but I guarantee you, I sell things that no one else does. And I do the turnover better than anybody. We sell bottom rubber. We sell second struts. We sell the nicest openers. And the difference is, is I fix it right. Here's what needs to be done. If you were my mom, here's exactly what I would be telling you. And I, that's my number one thing is take care of people like it's your mom and go out there and fix your mom's door. Make sure it's perfect. So when you look a customer in the eye, you say, this is exactly what I did for my mom. She's got a surge protector. She's got an operator reinforcement bracket. I changed her bottom rubber to keep the nasty bugs out. And I'm like, you got to be able to look people in the eyes. And if you don't believe in it, then I did something wrong. You got the best tools, the best trucks, the best parts. We've got trademark truck, trademark parts. We got max life. If you go to a one garage.com forward slash max, Trademark parts. When people are selling apples, apples, I'm selling oranges. It's 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 good stuff, Tommy. Thanks for thanks for putting that out there, man. And I, I, it's great how you have just figured out a way to package all that into something tangible for the the workers on your team that they're just they're bought in, right? They're bought in. They got to be bought in. And here's the deal: if you got a will, I'll find a way. But if you don't believe, if you don't believe that you're worth more, if you don't believe that you're you're meant to be in this world. If you don't believe that you look in the mirror and you say, I'm the baddest dude that ever lived or gal, then we got issues. I, I work so hard to make sure people believe in themselves. That's the hardest thing is I've had, I've had really amazing coworkers call me up and they, they've said, man, I'm, I'm letting you down. And I say, first thing I say is, listen, are you near a mirror right now? I need you to go smile in the mirror and believe in yourself. When you go to Hooters, you believe that you can pick up anybody if you're single. Like you got to believe in yourself because I can't stand a little bit taller, smile a little bit more, have fun, make friends while you're in the garage. If I could go back in time, I'd say to myself 10 years ago, I said, dude, your whole job is just to make friendships everywhere you go. You smile, you listen, active listening. And it just, it changes the way it just changes the way you feel. You're healthy. Your body's working better for itself. And, and, and I got to say, you actually start going through life a little bit happier. And that's really, really important to me. That was the second time I heard you say coworkers, uh, and most likely referring to your employees. Is that something you want to touch on? 
Well, yeah, I don't, I don't look at them as my employees. I get to work next to them and I get to hustle right next to them. And I'm just not a big fan of, I make my employees do this. They got to do push ups when they don't do stuff right. <laughs> I'm like, if I'm going to do push ups, I'm going to be right alongside of them. <laughs> so, so I just, there's mutual respect and I know what they go through. I know what our dispatchers and CSRs go through. When my mom used to book phone calls in 2010, she'd get on the phone and she'd be so empathetic. She kind of annoyed me because she spent 20 minutes on the phone talking about who knows what. But she'd be like, oh my gosh, honey, I am so sorry. Listen, we're going to get out there today. We're going to make this all better. And no one knew that it was my mom. The customers didn't know. So I show up to, this is when I was running jobs. And they go, oh my gosh, who is that lady? Like we've never, she just seems so happy. And, and, and they were literally like, it was so easy because they believed in us. So every touch point for the customer would, when you get great people that enjoy conversations and they smile on the phone and the dispatchers care, the clients are just like, you guys are the best. Go ahead and fix it. Do whatever it takes. And that's something that's very, very special. A lot of people are like, what happens when the new PE companies come into your industry and start buying companies? I'm like, good luck. I don't think they could stand a chance against us because of the, culture because people want to win and look we've got the money to do really really nice things and we feed the people a lot i think it's so important to break bread with 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 the coworkers and staff and um this is an amazing group of people and it's so crazy when everybody gets to win when everybody gets to make a lot of money and everybody gets you know we don't pay 100 percent of the insurance but i think we have a really fair plan it's a good plan uh we're gonna throw matching out there on the 401k next year there's just I'm always in favor of what can I do to be more gracious to the people. There's a guy named Keith Mercurio. He was at, uh, he's, he's at service time. He's a really, really great coach. He was a, a lead coach at Nextar, And he told me, he goes, listen, I, I coach Aaron Vahe, the CEO of the service Titan, you know, the founders. And, um, he said, it's amazing. Cause I said, isn't it hard when they take on investors? Cause they got a fiduciary responsibility to give as much money back to the investors. Right. And he goes, Tommy, I sit in that room every day and they're, t- they're, they're stuck between the decision. And they always, 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 always go in the favor of the trades. And I think that's so important when you're, when you're choosing profit or people, you choose the people and the profit comes. It's a byproduct. That's what people don't understand. Rockefeller back in the day, if you saw the men who made America, he used to be the kerosene guy and the byproduct of kerosene was gas. Well, this guy, Thomas Edison came out and he lit up America. He lit up the United States. So Rockefeller sitting there going, what do I do with this byproduct? And yet th- then he was the richest man ever because of fuel. And I think the byproduct of doing things great and taking care of people, the byproduct is profit. It comes naturally when you take care of people. Such a, a great analogy there, Tommy. And I was curious if that analogy carries into any other areas of your business where you started off producing or, or with one strategy that produced a byproduct that eventually ended up resulting in something great by itself. Like maybe you started off doing a certain training strategy and it ended up creating a whole other line of business that you hadn't initially intended. Or or maybe you, I mean, you do some of your own product generation as well. You know, maybe, maybe you experienced it there. Have there been any type of, uh, you know, uh, blessings in disguise or any, any type of like fruitful errors that you have made? You know, it's interesting. I, I had a guy come out and he explained service agreements to me in the HEC industry. And he said, you can never let a commissionable technician run service agreements. And I said, why? He goes, because that's not good for the client. You got to think what's best for the customer. And I said, so what do you do? He goes, we, we have tune up techs that go out and they build relationships and they take care of things and they're not, they're not commissionable. There's, there's a little bit of performance into that, but your main goal is to leave with a five out of five yet yeah, with a customer that's smiling and saying, this was the best investment. I love this service agreement because naturally you're waiting for them to want to replace the door eventually. And you're building friendships and really strong relationships. And so now we've got tune up techs. So, the greatest thing ever is if a guy's like, dude, I, I just don't love sales. I, I don't like, I, I don't know why sales is a bad word for a lot of people, but they say, I just, I, I love relationships. And I say, okay, great. We're going to move you into this department. You're going to make great money still. And there's really big opportunity because at a certain point, I truly believe it's not best to fix that door. Not when it's oxidized, it's dented, there's rips in it, the trim's messed up, the bottom rubber's failing, and it's just old. 
I don't want to slap lipstick on a pig. So I truly believe in replacing certain things when it gets to a point. And I just think do what's best for the client. And we don't know what's best till we, I, I always say this, we're a doctor. Okay. What does a doctor do? And I literally put on a whole doctor's outfit when I do my orientation for four hours to the new groups. And so I dress up like a doctor and I say, okay, tell me how much you're smoking. How much are you drinking? What kind of foods are you taking? What's your stress level like? And I go through all these things. And then when I give my rec- when I give my prescription, they, th- have you ever gone to the doctor? They said, this is going to make you better. And you say, nope, I'm going to, I'm going to shop around. I'm going to call a different doctor. No, you just say, yes, sir. You ask the right questions. So we how long are you planning on staying in the home? Tell me a little bit about what you do out in the garage. How often are you using it? We ask all these things. We diagnose the person before the problem. And that's so important. And we need to do that with, with, with the, the, the coworkers. So we, we need to ask them what, what motivates them. Find out what charges them. Find out what gets them excited. Do they, do they want to coach? Do they want to come up to the front of the room and talk about a big success? Do they hate doing that? Then you make people feel like crap going in front of the room and stuttering and not being good at it because – you know, that takes practice. So find out what motivates people and see to it that you, you, you work alongside of them to get what they dream of and they'll take care of you forever. So when you send a tune-up tech out to a home that has a door that is starting to age, how does that technician, if they're adverse to sales or uncomfortable with it, shall we say, how do they transition into a, a sales uh, environment or, or do they flip it to another technician? All they need to do is ask the simple question, have you ever thought about replacing this? And here's why. We've got 151 point tune up. 151 things we do. And there's pictures of all of it. And we say simply, did you ever think about replacing it? Here's why I'm asking. And if they say yes, you say, listen, I'm just a technician. I've got a guy that could build the whole door on the house. He's got the best promotions possible. He's like the wizard of doors. Let me give him a call. Let's see what we could do. And it's me and the customer versus a one. I'm an advocate for that customer. I am doing whatever I can to make sure they get whatever they, what they want in their home. The garage door is the smile of your home. It's 40% of your curb appeal. And it's the number one ROI, more than your kitchens or bathrooms. This is an investment. This is not a cost. And I think that that's so important that when we train these things, we go over it again and again and again and again and again. And I know that people hate the word role play, so we call it practicing. And we practice all day. If I was to walk into my training center right now, I guarantee you, they are practicing. They're, go, they're working through the motions, working on their tone, their empathy, their smiles, their question asking. If they're studying around, not too sure of themselves, not really, they don't. I always say operational plus technical equals sales. You got to know exactly what you're talking about. If my doctor is not really sure and he's stuttering and just, well, I'm not, well, I'm not 100% on this. Um, um, well, uh uh, you know, I uh, never really looked at this and before. You might wanna and uh, yeah, I recommend. Uh, I never say recommend. These parts are shot. They're failed. They're dangerous. They're not safe. We need to replace these. There's no hesitancy. I'm very, very confident when I walk in a garage. I am the man. I'm Tiger Woods on the golf course when I walk into that garage. You said uh, you said um, invest investment, not cost. Is that is that from Mr. Hopkins? You know, I've got a whole list of words. Um, it's called Maximum Influence. Joe Kosara turned me on to the book. And we never say cheapest. We say the most economical. We, we never say sign the contract. We say, okay, the paperwork. We never say financing. We say agreement. We, we, you, you know, th- these words matter so much. But I always tell the guys it's 96-4. 96% when you watch the best of the best, and we do a lot of ride-alongs, it's going to look so easy. You're going to wonder, how did that just happen? Because we, we know how to personally profile. We know the right questions to ask. We know when to pause. We know when to smile. We know when to play with the dog. We know when to ask about form, family, ocu- uh, occupation, recreational, and material things. We learn how to bond with people. We learn the way their face changes when they're talking about their kids. And we use that to build friendships and take care of people. Tommy, our industry, uh, like yours, is starved for good people. And the HVAC, plumbing, and electrical industries, you know, have unfortunately dealt with a bit of a trades gap. And, and now, finally, people are starting to get back into it. Uh, but it is certainly a, a younger person's uh, upcoming. And, and there's a lot in there that we try to look for in terms of confidence. How have you found it to be effective in training into somebody that I am Tiger Woods on the golf course, as you said, 
How do you develop that confidence level in somebody or do you hire for that and then just train around it? I hire people with a great handshake. I got what I call the beer test. What I go have a beer with them. Can they tell an interesting story? Do they, do they ask great questions? Do they want more out of their life? Are they content making 70 grand a year? Cause I know I don't have anybody well, it's my coworkers that is content with 70,000, 80,000, a hundred thousand. They want more. And the, the three letters we teach all the time is all you got to do is ask. And I teach them to ask, 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 ask. Every time you see a great server or a bus boy, ask them if they want to do a ride along, take a selfie with them, text message them and say, look, look, I want you to experience this. It's changed my life. I'm a better dad. I'm a better husband. And I want you to be able to experience this. Just do yourself a favor, do a ride along with me, see what you think of it. And I'll, I'll, I'll help you come up in the trades. And here's what's so cool about it. You get to get home for dinner. You get two days off every, unless you want to pick up extra days, you can, you can go anywhere. We're in 20 States, 30 markets. You, we're, we're looking at a company in Hawaii. I want to be able to send guys to Hawaii and have three days to go have fun and work a few days and enjoy themselves. And, and that's how you recruit is you say, listen, my life now, this is my life. I just bought a house. I don't have any credit card debt. I'm, I'm there for my kid's soccer practice. I, I, I'm now investing in my relationships with my wife and my kids. And I want that for you. And you should just come check it out. You owe it to yourself. That's a pretty compelling statement. And one of the things that you have going for you, Tommy, is certainly your scale. I mean, you said 20 states and all these different markets and everything, and that's absolutely appealing. But a vast majority of people, whether they're listening to this podcast or just in general in the nation, work for a much, much, much smaller company. And of course, that was you at one point. So looking back upon your time when you were that three, four, five man operation, what were the things that you would go back and tell yourself then that you should be focusing on? Well, I learned how to make a budget over the last few years. And the personal budget is so important for, for these guys. But Instead of reverse engineer what's in it for them. I, I read a book, um, The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy, and he explains the 100 things he wanted in a woman. He wrote them all down, and then he read the list out loud and said, man, this is like the perfect chick. He goes, I can't even get a girl like this. So he had to write down 100 things he would need to become to even to come up to the level he would have to become to get a person that he dreamed of or dreamt of. So what did I do? I didn't write down a list of a hundred things I wanted in a woman. I wrote down a hundred things and I didn't get to a hundred, but I wrote down things that I would need to become to get the type of people I'd want to work around that would actually want to do the best thing for the client and the best thing for the company. And they're sprinting in the same direction. So I knew we'd have to communicate regularly. We'd have really powerful, impactful meetings. We would need to have performance pay where they could make a lot, a lot of money. We would need to do things outside of work. And the biggest thing is you, you got to build relationships. And I'll tell you this, if one of my technicians calls me, I'm taking that call. And here's the one thing I tell them is if you got bad news, call Brian, Luke, Mike Bailey, don't call me. If you got good news, I want to share it with everybody. I, I'm just not good at bad news. I mean, I'll, I get bad news. I, I do. And I've got a lot of great people around me that are specialists at what they do. I don't hire CFOs that don't have experience. I hire the best that are smarter than I'll ever be in that particular bracket in which they're in the org chart. And listen, we pay really, really well, but I'll tell you, equity does a lot of things. Now they, they understand what it's going to do for their family with, with these things. And it's amazing because there will be a day that I bring on partners because there's no way I could buy all these companies with the bank, not, not, not in a recession, but they're going to, I'm going to make lots and lots and lots of millionaires. I'll make, Millionaires from the employees, which are my coworkers. I'll make business owners that have a great business that they're just looking, they want something more. Like, like here's what I tell somebody that wants to partner with me. I say, just write down your dream job, write down why you got into the business, write down what you love to do. And I promise you, they say, well, how much PTO do you give? Unlimited, but it's real PTO. You're really taking off. You don't have to bring your phone with you. We'll have you covered. You want to take two months off as long as you're covered. I don't care. So I think it's pretty compelling when you can sit down with somebody and say, let's find out what you love and let's give you that role. So I don't want to, I don't want to gloss over the event you have coming up. I mean, we, we want to talk about it as, as well as I'm sure you do and then put it out there for everyone who might want to attend. Um, but 
your event aside for a second, how, how much has trade events and that kind of thing done for you? My, my personal first event of any kind was as you and I had talked about Tom Hopkins, um, sales boot camp in, in your neighborhood in Scottsdale, Arizona, back in like 2004. And then I think, I think I went three years, oh four, oh five, oh six. And this was not, not trade related the slightest bit, but that's where I learned the, the fear words, you know, the words you never say on a, on a sales call or, um, in any kind of closing techniques or, uh, selling strategies, I guess you'd say, I'd never heard of anything like that. And that opened my eyes to a whole other world. And then from there I went to, uh, Jim Abrams had a, a, a clockwork convention, you know, one hour Ben Franklin, Mr. Sparking, like probably Oh six or something like that. And Ken Goodrich took several of us from the team to that at the Rio in Las Vegas. And then that was a whole, it was just a whole new world opened up to me that I just, I didn't understand existed. And everyone thinks like these, these conventions and these events are for owners of the company, um, which I'm not an owner of the company or they think they're just for managers, which, you know, when I went to my first two versions of these, I wasn't in management. I was just a tech in a, in a plumbing truck. And I, I can't tell you how these kind of things have shaped my life and career and, and show me bigger and better worlds out there. And I was just wondering if you decided to put an event on because that same thing happened for you. Have you, has, have these kind of things had a big impact on yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to be asked to keynote at a bunch of things coming up. Lance St. Clair with one hour air, Benjamin Franklin and uh, Mr. Sparky asked me yeah, to speak buddy. at their event. The 400 franchises, you know, or 350, whatever. So I'm speaking of that coming audience, up. My man. It's going to be so much fun. And I, I promised him that I'm going to, I'm going to bring the fire. And I think I'm the keynote at roofing, roofing con. And I'm speaking at a big landscaping event. And so now I get to be part of them, but it took me going to these things, networking, asking great questions, taking notes. And here's the, here's the secret sauce is implementing. You know, I asked Ken Goodrich to be at the next vertical track. Everybody wants to see him. He's a, he's a legend. Uh, I've got LEV, Keith Mercurio, like the people that I learned so much from, I'm like, we need to share this. And here's what I did. Um, I don't make money at these events. I make a lot of money in my garage or business. I mean, I, I think we're going to make like 40 million this year. So I don't need to do these events. I don't care about profit. You know, we cover our costs, which is, uh, you know, 50 grand if, if for a dinner, just, just the dinner. And, you know, there's a lot of paid speakers. So I, I like to not lose a bunch of money in the process. But overall, one of the things I did is I went and visited Jack Tester. Um, and I asked him to allow, allow us in the garage, garage resident the next year. And he said, well, we're too focused on what we're doing. So Julian ended up being the CEO of the company. And he said, look, dude, why don't you just start your own? We're, we're membership owned. We're not going to do that. So I started Garage Door Freedom and then I started Home Service Freedom. So vertical track, home service freedom. And I went out to all these vendors that I use, whether it's buying trucks, uniforms, tools, uh, any type of marketing you can think of, how to get bad reviews taken down that, that don't comply with Google and Yelp. Every single thing, I worked out partnerships with them. And I took my CEO, Adam Cronenberg, who's a genius. And I've made a partnership with Service Titan and House Call Pro and a lot of amazing businesses. And I said, I want you to give a rebate and I want a better price for everything. And I did this with manufacturers, you name it. And we started this thing called home service freedom. And so I split the rebates because Adam makes a lot of money. I've got several employees there, but what's so cool about this thing is I'm able to share everything that we've done. Um, and basically it's like next star. And what's super cool about it is I didn't know this at the time. I really didn't have these intentions, but there's a lot of people that are like, dude, I want what you have with your employees. How, how can we partner up? Can you make me a millionaire? Boom. Yeah. Millions of dollars. And I'll give you the job of your dreams. And it's kind of shifted now to be like, and I don't care. Listen, I have franchises come to these things all the time that we'll never partner up. But what I love about it is the networking, the relationships that come out of these things, the people that say, listen, dude, Hey, have you heard of this? This changed my company. Do you know how many people call me and they say, I've gotten you, you, I did the one thing you told me to do. I raised my prices, whatever it is. I owe you this to you. And they, they genuine, genuinely want to help me. 
And that's the best gift of all is when people call you up and they say, man, you've done a lot for me. My family's never been better. Hey, have you ever thought about doing this? This changed my life. I was just curious. I thought, I thought I'd tell you about it because I think it'll impact you. It'll impact your life, your business, your relationships. And that's what I get. That's, that's the ultimate. That's, so this event is, it's not like a lot of other events. It's like, we're going to make a bunch of money on this, but I want to impact people's lives and I want them to implement. Howard Partridge wrote a book, Failure to Implement. When you come to this event, you're going to take things and I'm going to force you to put them on your counter and get them done. You will no longer be a firefighter. You'll be a strategist. You'll have a strategy, a standard operating procedure, a checklist to get an expected result. And you will implement. I promise you when you come here, everybody that left there, everybody. I've had so many speakers say, man, I, I go to these things all the time. Yours, I couldn't. I listen to every speaker because they came for a different reason. They want people to grow. I mean, look, at the end of the day, yeah, some of these speakers get paid a good money, but at the end of the day, they're there to deliver something very, very special. I don't have any really, really famous athletes or anything like that coming. This is all, I don't have Mike Tyson or anybody. I got the best of the best that's going to change people's lives. And that's what this is about. It's about to get on track and go straight up with your business, which is vertical. Hence the word vertical track, and it has to do with garage doors. But we're, we're trying to change lives. I, there was a lot of technicians and CSRs. We got... If you go to verticaltrack.com, we've got people, technicians that went from $400 ticket average to $1,200 ticket averages. We've got CSRs that we're booking at 50% that are now at 87%. So we wanted to bring, bring it to everybody. We've got a, a Michael, uh, not Michael, I had Michael McKellowitz at the last one, but we have uh, Michael Burnoff, just really all about the neurological side of being happy and not settling for less. He's speaking. Uh, Alan Roar, I'm, I'm going to be asking her a bunch of questions. Uh, she's just the best I've ever seen at understanding financials and really how to impact those. And she understands the franchise model, if that's what you're looking for. I, I just think the people that I've asked to do this, I said, listen, this is not about money. This is about changing lives. And if you guys want to be part of this, you need to bring it. And th you know what? That's what that's what we're doing. So, Tommy, are, are, are tickets still available for that? And what are the dates? Yeah, so it's October... 12th, 13th, and 14th, people say, I'm not sure if I can take the time off. I'm not sure if, if this makes sense. And I'm like, can you really afford not to? It's, it's, it's a drop in the bucket for what it's going to bring to you. I, look, if you don't come to this event, you just need to invest in yourself at other events. I went and did a tour of a $15 million HVAC company recently in New York. I was out there for fun. And what I found was he's third generation. And I said, what events do you go to? Have you heard of next star network? Have you heard, he worked with Al Levy in the past, but that's it. I said, have you ever read red maximum influence? Have you read Robert Cedini influence? What kind of podcast are you listening to? And it was like nothing. And I'm like, this dude would be doing 150 million if he invested in himself and learned, but th they're content. That's the scariest thing in the world is being content saying I'm okay where I'm at. Every day I wake up, I want to better my best. I want to be the best version of myself. I want to increase the, everything. You know, that's one thing about me is I'm very, very happy. I'm happy with the team, everything we're accomplishing, but I'm never, ever, ever going to settle. I'm never content. And the, the only guy, there's only one person that I'm going after, and hopefully we'll become friends one day, Elon Musk. He's the number one. Why would I aspire to be Warren Buffett or anybody else? And I don't want to be Elon Musk, but I love that he's got the same hours in the day that we have. And you study him. He's changing the way. He's got satellite phones for third world countries. He's going to Mars. He's investing in rockets and, and increasing mankind to the next level. He's got such a bigger why. And that's what I plan on doing is morphing into a much bigger reason for being here and hopefully being as impactful as possible. So what in, in what way would you want to make the biggest impact? And I, I'm, I'm sure I know the answer, and it's the same answer we would probably give with this podcast. Um, but, but what impact particularly is it that you really want to make? Well, I'll tell you this. There's a great book called Seven Habits of Highly Successful People by Stephen Covey. And what he explains is what are people going to say to you when you're gone? I, I, the day of celebration will be the day that I die. It won't, there'll be fireworks and there'll be lives that have been changed. And I hope it's, it's something that I could give for, for 
centuries to come. But ultimately, I want to have an impact. I want people's lives to be enriched better. I want them to live in the now and enjoy themselves. And there's a lot of people out there that just don't know any better. So I hope, I hope to just enrich lives and make people happier and better relationships. And, you know, I don't know what 10 years looks down the road, but I know it's not only going to be home service. There's so much more. I think I, I, I'm trying to impact the home service community as much as possible. I'm in the now. This is what I'm doing. But there's going to be bigger, greater things that I think my life is going to be morphed into. I don't have all the answers yet because I, I do look – pretty far down the line, but I just know that every day I'm working at things to, to increase people around me because it, it's a weird feeling when you start helping people and you start impacting lives that you want more of it. I'm selfish. I want to impact more lives. I want more people to text me and say, man, I got to make it to my kid's football game for the first time in five years. And now I get to, I go on a camping trip here, here. that I never thought possible. And freedom is what I call it. I want to give people more freedom. Where did, where did that come from, Tommy? I mean, were you born with just like, I want to help everybody else out in the world or, or did that come from something in your past? No, no. There was days that I walked up to work and hated everybody. They were out having smoke breaks. Nobody was running in the same path. I literally thought I was the hardest worker and I used to look down at people and say, they'll never be like me and I'm the hardest worker here and they don't deserve what I have. And it all changed when I was just being around guys like Al Levy that give back. And, you know, Al Levy tells this story that his daughter in seventh grade, she was, uh, they were saying, what, what do you want? What, what, what do you, where do you want to go on a trip? What, what do you want? Uh, what do you want most in your life right now? And she said, I just want my dad. I want to spend more time with my dad. So Nancy, Al's wife, she goes, do you know what your daughter said she wanted today? And he tells this story with tears. And he said, she just wants to be with her dad more. And he said, he said that broke him. That completely broke him. So he said, all right, Nancy. He, 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 didn't, he didn't give up. He said, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create manuals. I'm going to create strategies to get an outcome. I'm going to make sure that when we go on vacation, I don't have my cell phone. I, I guess it was a beeper probably back then. And he said, I'm going to make sure to build a business that could stand on its own feet when I'm not there. And two years later, I mean, he was there, he was around his family, but he worked tirelessly nights and weekends and boom, two years on the date, he went to Hawaii, no interruptions. He got to live in the now he got to be a better father. And that is impactful. And, you know, I, I would say this, that when it starts to happen, it's really hard to give, give, everything you got into every other person when you're broke, when you're barely making payroll, when you barely are sleeping because you're so worried that you're not going to have parts the next day, when you're worried about giving people, whether it's insurance or 401ks or PTO, because you can't afford to, that's no life to live because I've been there and I don't want that for anybody. You know, it's stressful. There's a lot of anxiety. And when you start pricing right and you start focusing on winning, and you focus on everyone else winning is when it just starts to be, it, it, it's fun. It's the infinite game, as Simon Sinek would say. Well, truly an inspirational message there, Tommy. And we're going to take a, we're going to take a break here on this episode. Um, and then we'll come back next week to discuss more about what you have in this story and the thoughts that are going up in the mind of Mello. Uh, but want to thank you for your time today on this episode and uh, all the things that you've brought forth uh, for our listening audience. I appreciate being here. This was a blast. Hey, that's a wrap for this podcast. We hope that you enjoyed part one of our time with Tommy Mello. He's always such an interesting and inspiring guest. And so many of the things he brought out in this particular piece of the episode about caring for your people, about training, about investing in them is just awesome. And I, I love his motivation and I love the, the mindset that he brings to the table as an owner and not just an owner of a business, but an owner of a significant business. And I love how he just brings it so real uh, each time that he's on with us. Remember, if you're interested in checking out his event, Vertical Track, that is in October, coming up here very shortly, October 12, 13, and 14. And like Brian said at the top of the show, if you use promo code VT, waste no day, that's VT is in Vertical Track, waste no day. Uh, you will get $250 off of a ticket for that event. So thanks to our friend Tommy for making that happen. 
And uh, I'm sure if you take advantage of that, it will be well worth your time. We're looking forward to going ourselves. For now, we're going to leave you with our weekly challenge, which is to make sure that you're choosing to wake up every single morning and waste no day.